I, uh, I want to begin by simply saying what I said in the first service. Unless the leaders of our countries, unless the doctors and the people that are in charge, if they're not hiding something from us, then this is not going to be a big deal. If they're hiding something from us, then it may be a much bigger deal than what we think. But um, I'm glad that God's people don't have the spirit of fear. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Politicians do that. Problems financially do that. Health problems does that. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. And so I'm thankful that I've got a sound mind. I'm thankful that you have a sound mind. And you have a spirit that's not a fear. You know, I, before I was saved, I was in the panic mode. And by the way, I've seen a lot of people in the panic mode the last few days. When the president announced a national state of emergency, everybody kind of kicked in the, the emergency mode. And uh, before I was saved, I was living in the emergency mode, or in the uh, fear mode, and I was in that panic mode. And when the Holy Spirit convicted me, I was really in the panic mode. And I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, and ever since I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I'm in the Jesus mode. Amen. In fact, I'm on cruise control. I'm just going through. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid. I'm blessed. Amen. And you're blessed, and we can thank God that our God is bigger than anything that would come our way, and I rejoice in the fact that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Amen. I want you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? Haven't you known? Don't you hear? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not. Neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no to them that have no might he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up, up, up with wings as an eagle. And they shall run and be not weary. And they shall walk and not faint. I draw your attention to verse 28. It says, Neither is he weary. God faints not, neither is weary. I want to use for a subject this morning, God's not weary. You may be seated. Our unwearied God. I am thankful for the fact that this is the National Day of Prayer. I pray for the, my country every day of the week anyway. I don't have to be asked to pray for the nation. I do it on a regular basis. I find myself apologizing for to God more than I do praying for the nation. I apologize to Him for the way we treat Him as a nation. And if you don't think that's scripture, you can go to the book of Daniel and discover that Daniel apologized for Israel over and over again for the way they were doing. And Daniel said, I'm sorry, God, for the way the people are doing you. And I'm very sorry for the way the United States of America is doing our Lord. A preacher, as I said in the first service, a preacher called me from North Carolina and he said, I'm so excited says, God has humbled our nation. He's got the nation attention, and I agree with that to some extent. And he said, people are going to start seeking God. And I said to him, well, right now they're just seeking toilet paper. <laughs> and I hope they seek something other than toilet paper. I hope they do seek the Lord. 
And I hope that they don't have to use all that toilet paper because if they do, I don't want to be around them at all. <laughs> that's right, amen, I don't. How many want to be around people that would use all of that? Man, I tell you, that's bad stuff. But remember the nation in prayer. This is a national day of prayer. But I want to talk to you about our God is not weary. An employer, because of the employee's failures from time and time again, will become weary of their employee. Someone that is battling sickness in their life and they're struggling with arthritis or maybe some other sickness that just wears at their bone, just wears down deep in their marrow. They become weary. You look around and the pressure's all around us and we can become weary. But I'm sure glad that we don't have a God that's weary. I'm glad that our God is long-suffering. I don't like suffering at all. Short suffering, I don't even care for. But the Bible says that God is long suffering. He's, he's, he's not a God that gets weary with us. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. As I said earlier, a person who gets fired from their job, maybe they come to work late, maybe they don't do a good job, but an employer that fires their employee is not long-suffering. You give someone a chance over and over again and finally you reach a place that you no longer want to help someone because you're not long suffering. Someone battles a sickness in their body and then they give up. I'm told that burn victims give up because they're in so much pain they give up and many times a burn victim will die because they just give up. They're not long suffering. And I don't know what you put God through in your life, but I'm telling you, God is long-suffering. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what has transpired in your life, but God never gives up. Hey, listen to me. God never gives up. He's a long-suffering God. And the Bible says that one of the fruits of the Spirit of God, according to the book of Galatians, is that we as children of God ought to be long-suffering. Are you hearing me? Long-suffering. I'm thankful for the fact that God is long-suffering, meaning that if I fail Him, if I miss the mark, if I do something that... And how many in this room would wave at me and say, I've aggravated God before? Would you wave at me? Have you ever aggravated God before? I know you have. You've aggravated me. <laughs> and I know that I've aggravated you. And you've been pretty long-suffering over these 25 years. Some of them did, and they left. But anyway, but God's a good God. And whatever we face in life, God never gives up on you. The only way for you to miss out is for you to give up on yourself. Don't ever give up on yourself. Because God will never give up on you. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Isn't that wonderful? Thank God that God is long-suffering. And no matter how many times I fail God, I can just get up, dust myself off, and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. And God's never going to get in my face and say, Sorry? You're sorry? No, God's not going to do that. Because God's not out to put you down. God's out to pick you up. Amen? Amen? I seen a picture on Facebook that was called the Toilet Paper Apocalypse. 
and they had the rider of the white horse and the rider and the red horse and the pale horse and, and the, the, the horse of, of spotted, that spotted horse, and they're riding out with their sickle and they're riding the, the apocalypse, the four horsemen of Revelation, and they got this guy, the, the, I think it's the horse of death, he's got a big old pack of toilet paper in his hand. In his hand, he's riding out on a horse, and the other people on the apocalypse horses turned back and said, "Seriously?" <laughs> and that's how I feel today about what's happening. Seriously, Amen. Give me some steak, Amen. Give me some food. Don't want to run out of that. I'm not afraid of starving to death. I'm not afraid to start. Hey, if the grocery store shut down today, the dandelions are coming up in my yard. And they're edible. In fact, the gooseberries are coming on. Blackberries are coming on. You couldn't starve a Missouri boy. They know what's edible and what ain't. And sometimes they eat things that's not edible. I'm not afraid of not having food. I'm not afraid of not having something to drink. There's Rayleigh Creek, Macaulay Creek, Macaulay Branch, Rayleigh Creek. There's Finley River. There's James River. Amen? I can go down to Finley River. Suck it up. You say, well, preacher, that's nasty. I did it as a kid and I survived. In fact, the water that flows through Finley River and James River, even as nasty as it is, is better than third world countries, the water they drink. Amen? Now there is one place I won't go drink the water and that's in swimming pools. Because I know what they do in it. When they ain't swimming, they got this serious look on their face. They're not just concentrating about the water. Hello? Say, preacher, I can't believe you said that. Well, believe on. Keep believing, my friend. But God is long-suffering. I don't know what you've done, maybe last night or night before or last week, but God's not give up on you. God is long-suffering. God will never give up on you. And because of that, we should not give up on others. We should always be there trying not to give up on others, being long-suffering. Amen? Now, there comes a place where you've got to draw the line. There comes a place where you've got to take your stand. There comes a place where you've got to say, okay, if they don't want help, I can't help them. But we're always there. We're there, and God is always there for you, and we should always be there for others if they really need and want help. Amen? I know I hate it when I get so religious around you. There's something in me that just, you know, I like to just say, that one's out, that one's out, that one's out, and that one's in, that one's in, that one's in. But that ain't how. God didn't go through the church and say, that one's out, and that one's out, and that one's out, and that one's out, and that one's out. And I don't like how that one looks. That one's out. I don't like how that one dresses. That one's out. That one's looking at me bad. That one's out. <laughs> out the window. You say, you're looking at me? Probably. <laughs> Amen? And God is not going to destroy you unless you destroy yourself first. And when you destroy your first, yourself first, then you have no place but to go to the destroy pile, to go to the place that's already destroyed. You take junk and you throw it in the trash. But then there's always someone that's long-suffering that goes to the trash and says, I can use that. Her name is Judy, my wife. I can use that. You people take junk and put it out beside your trash can. You should hide it. Because you take it and put it beside your trash can, my wife drives by. And I know before we get home, she's going to circle by that place again. And the next thing I know, that thing that's by the trash can is now on my front drive. 
because I can fix that. That'll come in handy. Well, when God looks at you and you're a wreck, God says, I can fix that. When someone else throws you out, God says, I can fix that. I can take care of that. And I just want to say to everybody in this room, if you feel like God's given up on you, you're wrong. You're wrong. If you feel like God's out of patience with you, you're wrong. Don't you just love coming to church and hear the preacher say, wrong, wrong, wrong. I'll never amount to anything. Wrong. Amen? Well, that preacher's not preaching a very good sermon today. Wrong. I just want to say to everybody in this room, God is long-suffering, and He's not going to give up on you. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering as well, and we should be long-suffering with others as well. Amen? Come on, can I get a good amen from that? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, neither is He weary. God is not weary. Now, there's something I want to point out in verse 28. It says, don't you know, haven't you heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now that doesn't mean you're searching his understanding. It says God doesn't faint. It says God doesn't fail. It says it's bragging about God. God, haven't you heard that, that God doesn't faint, have you heard that God doesn't fail? Haven't you heard, don't you know that he's everlasting God? And then he puts it on there, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. That doesn't mean there's no searching for understanding in your life. It means God is not confused about his understanding. Isn't it great to have a God that's not confused? I'm glad to have a God that's not confused because there's confusion everywhere. And the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. And I'm glad that God's not confused. God knows exactly what he's going to do with you. I don't know what he's going to do with you. But God knows what he's going to do with you. There might be some parents in there don't know what they're going to do with you. There might be some children not going to know what they're going to do with that. There may be someone in this room not know what you're going to do with the pastor. You're going to love me and care for me and take care of me. Amen. To the, all the days of my life. That's what you're going to do. Amen? Amen? You're not going to put me in a nursing home and tuck me away and say, no, 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 no. We're going to keep you out of trouble. You can't keep me out of trouble in a nursing home. I'll have them all lined up preaching to them. <laughs> now, a nursing home's okay if, it, if a person needs to be there, but look at me. I don't need to be there. Amen? They told me when, when I was in the car wreck, the doctor said, well, you need to go to the nursing home. I said, you need to get out of my room. <laughs> and then I said, no, 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 you need to go to the nursing home. We'll put you in a nursing home for a short time. I said, I ain't buying that nonsense. He said, no, really, we'll just put you in a nursing home until you rehabilitate and get to where you can walk. And blah, 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 blah. I said, wrong. I'm not going. He said, you can't even walk. I said, fine. I said, I've got enough men in the church. They can carry me into my house. And once I'm carried into the house, put in that nice soft chair, I ain't going nowhere. Guess what? I didn't go. And the men didn't carry me into the house. Judy did. But anyway, <laughs> got me in that nice soft chair. No, she didn't do it. I, I got to where I can walk. But you remember I used to crawl up these stairs just to preach. I'd get down on the floor and crawl up the stairs. You remember that, don't you? I remember. I remember when we go into the side and I'd crawl up. I remember in the sound booth. I hate being in a church where I can't go anywhere. I'm the pastor. Amen? 
as the pastor, I should be able to say to Scott, get up, I want to sit in that chair. I ought to be able to say to Dave, get up, I want to sit in your chair. Why? Because I ought to be able to sit anywhere I want to, but I'm choosing to sit in the chair that God appointed me to sit in. I don't want to sit in the seat of the scornful. I don't want to sit in the seat of the critical. I want to sit in the seat that God has led me in, to sit in. Amen? And so, I don't like being in a place where I can't go somewhere, anywhere in the church I want to go. So, at the sound booth, pretty good step. And, and I crawled up there. Why'd you crawl up there? I, don't, I crawled up there because I wasn't supposed to. Why'd you crawl up there? Because I couldn't crawl up there. But I did. Amen? Kind of like that joke they used to tell. I think President Reagan used to tell that joke where the guy's walking through the graveyard. He's drunk, and they've dug a fresh grave. And the guy falls into the grave, and he can't get out. He's jumping. He just can't get out. And, and he finally gets exhausted, and, and uh, he goes to sleep. Another guy walks through, and he falls in the grave. And it's there in the night, and he's jumping, and he's jumping, and he's jumping. And the drunk wakes up and reaches over and taps the other guy on the shoulder and says, you'll never get out of here. But he did. <laughs> Hello. There are a lot of things you can do when you have to. But the Bible says that God is not confused. He, he, he has a plan. God has a plan. And did you know a plan brings comfort. A plan, uh, uncertainty brings fear. Uncertainty, well, the, the thing we have such fear today over this coronavirus is because there's uncertainty. We don't know what's coming. Well, I got news for you. Before there was ever a coronavirus, there was uncertainty without Christ. Amen? Amen? I mean, I, I don't know what a jitterbug is, but a jitterbug would get you without Jesus. Amen? And so, you know, and I hope a jitterbug ain't bad. But anyway, well, any kind of bug's bad. I don't like cockroaches. I don't like ladybugs, which, by the way, are hypocrites. They're actually men. Really, ladybugs are actually male. They're not female. And we call them ladybugs. First mention of sexual identity. Hello. I know. It's horrible, but I'm going to finish anyway. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, God has a plan. God has a plan all worked out. Number three, God has a plan all worked out. God's people, God's people have a flight plan out of here. Does you know God's people have a flight plan out of here? God has a plan. He has a plan all worked out for us. He has a way to get us off the planet alive into the presence of God. God has a way to bring us out of our darkness into marvelous light. God has a plan to bring us in even, even in a place where we're just not achieving much in life. But God has a plan for you. And God's plan is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And God's plan is long-suffering, and God's plan is merciful and grace and kind. And so God has a plan for you, thoughts of good and not evil. Good plans for you, things that God wants you to have. God wants you to, be, God wants you to succeed. It's sad, but there's people out there that want you to fail. It's sad, but there's people out there that want you to wash down the drain. There's people that want you to fail, but God wants you to succeed. I hate to say it, but there's people that want churches to fail. Who in the world would want a church to fail? I want them to bust at their seams. I want them to grow. I want preachers to be blessed. I want the house of God to be uh, honoring our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But God has a plan. God has a flight plan for all of us. Did you know that? We're going to leave here one of these days and we're going to go by the way of Jesus Christ into the clouds. Let me read this to you. The Lord's people have a flight plan to heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 through 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, I do. 
that if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus, that are them there in the graveyard, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall, uh, um, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That's them that are dead, sleeping physically in the grave. For the Lord himself des shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I love that, comfort one another with these words. The beautiful part about this is God's flight and God's plan, flight plans for us will be on schedule. God's on schedule. Let me say this, God's on schedule. The world is insane, but God's on schedule. There's fear in every city, every community. There's fear everywhere, but God's on schedule. The world's crumbling, but God is on schedule. And one of these days, he will descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of an archangel. And we have flight plans. And you're not going to get on board with hate in your heart toward your neighbor. You're not going to get on board with adultery and fornication in your spirit. You're not going to get on board with iniquity in your heart and Rejection of Christ in your life. You're not going to get on board. You, you, it's for the redeemed. Our going out of here is for the redeemed. And I don't know what we're going to face in the next few weeks. I hope it'll be nothing. I don't even want a common cold. I don't even want a hangnail. I don't even want one of them cuticles on the end of my finger. Hello? Nobody wants to be sick, and I don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks. I think it'll be nothing, actually. I don't think much is going to come out of it. But if it does, then you can tell me I was wrong. But I'm not going to get up and tell my church to panic. Because God's a big God. There's plenty of time to pray. There's plenty of time to seek the Lord under adverse conditions, and and we ought to pray in the calm conditions that we have now. But let me say this real quickly. You see the confusion and you see the panic now. Can you imagine what the rapture of the church would do to folks that miss it? Hello? Can you imagine if the church were to be caught up in a moment and twinkle an eye, those who are left, it wouldn't be a raid on the stores. It'd be breaking out the glass and stealing everything they can steal. After the church is caught up, it'll be totally chaos. Amen? And they won't be stealing toilet paper. Excuse me, toilet paper. Whatever they call it. I used to go to the outhouse and, and use newspaper. Used to be in the woods and use, never mind. But anyway. But I just want to say to everybody in this room, don't get in a fizz. Now, if you're out of Dr. Pepper, that's serious. If you're out of Coca-Cola, that's serious. If you're out of coffee, that's too bad. I'm, I'm making friends. I'm influencing people and making friends. I mean, come on. We don't want our life changed. We want our life blessed. We want everything to go smooth. It's not time to panic about anything. Jesus is bigger than all our troubles. And in my Father's house is peace. In my Father's house, God's on schedule. 
And all this you're seeing happening, fear-mongering, disease, and if this disease does sweep through the nation like they think it may, i seen them washing the streets down somewhere. Where was it? Over in Italy or somewhere. They were washing the streets down because there was so much disease and sickness. I don't know whether that's hype. It could be a, a very horrible pandemic. But I remember when the swine flu was really pretty bad. I remember when any flu's bad. And then they had the bird flu and the Hong Kong flu and the swine flu. And did you know that all flu comes from pigs? I said I'd throw that in. I heard, seen a documentary on that one time. All flu comes from swine. It makes you want to have a bacon and tomato sandwich, don't it? <laughs> right? But I want to stand for Jesus. I want to let other people know. Because, see, God's, everything falling around, the earthquakes, the fires, the, the devastation, the floods, the tornadoes, the uh, hurricanes, the disease, the pestilence, uh, the murder, the ISIS, the, the, the killing, the murder of, of abortion, little innocent babies, the, the chaos in political arena, all the havoc, all the things that's going around, and it's us like insanity has gripped our nation. And it's true, if there are spaceships that pass by us, other plant, people from other planets, they do roll up their windows and they do lock their doors. Because we're nuts. <laughs> Hello. But anyway, all this stuff, but I want you to know God's right on time. It's going to happen. We're there. I'm excited. It's going to happen. Will it get worse? You bet you. Will it get more fearful? Absolutely. I'm just hoping we're out of here before it gets totally bazooka. And we may be out of here. We may not be out of here. But God's right on time. His plan is right on time. Amen. Amen? And so I bring you to the last two thoughts. And that is Jesus is about to introduce us to the Father. You say, I thought you said two thoughts. Yeah, he's about to enter, introduce us to the Father. Here's the two thoughts. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm about to introduce you to the Father. Something else. Luke chapter 12 verse 8. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. There you go. Jesus is about to confess us to the Father. He's about to in introduce us to the Father. Now, do I know the Father? You bet you I know the Father. I know the Father through Jesus Christ. Do I have the Father? Absolutely. I have the Father through Jesus Christ. So I know the Father, and He knows me. But oh, glorious day, when I go home and Jesus takes me by the hand and walks me to the Father and says, I want to introduce James to you, Father. This is the one I've been talking about. This is the one I've been praying for. This is the one I died for. I want to introduce you to the Father. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to introduce us to the Father. Not only does He want to introduce us to the Father, but Jesus wants to introduce us to the angels. Now, I, I'd much rather be introduced to the Father. That's a whole lot more exciting. But I want to excite the angels too. Come on. I'm going to be excited to be introduced to the Father. The angels are going to be excited to be introduced to me. Hello? Hello? 
You say, I don't believe that. The Bible says, no, you're not. You shall judge the angels. Doesn't the Bible say the angels desire to look into this thing called salvation? Then am I stretching anything? Am I saying anything that isn't realistic? The angels are in, are in, they are obsessed with meeting us. They want to materialize before us. They want you and I to be introduced to them because they want to get excited. There's someone washed in the blood of my Lord, my Creator. Angels don't have nothing on me. The angels would love. And by the way, I think angels minister to us and unaware we, we entertain angels. But I think a whole lot more of them angels would materialize before us if God would give them permission. But God ain't giving them permission most of the time. And you said, well, why don't he give, us, give the angels permission? Because your heart can't take it and you ain't ready for you to go to heaven yet. Now, I met people that seen angels and I'll not mention who they were, but I, I believe that they have seen angels. I have no reason to believe that they haven't. But I'm so excited. Very soon. The Father has plans. He has flight plans for you and I. And the Father has plans to remove us from this room into His glorious mansion. His room. Isn't that good? And so I'm going to say to everybody in this room, this auditorium, I'm looking forward to the day that Jesus introduces me to the Father. Now, does the Father know me? Yes. Do I know Him? Yes. Is there going to be anything new to the Father? Not really. But it's going to be incredible for me. I'm going to be introduced to the Father. And you can believe what you want to, but I believe it'll be pretty exciting for the angels to get a good look at us too. Stand with me. I want to invite you today. They've been working on this PA. We just got a new soundboard, new PA, and I hope it sounds better for you. have been trying to work on it because of the... We're going to be buying some new monitors. We're going to get new monitors put in. We're going to get these speakers moved forward so that it doesn't squeal. And... Uh, and so, if there's any squealing going on, I want it to be you, not the speakers, when we're preaching. But anyway, we've got to get these speakers moved forward. We've got to get some new monitors, and we're going to try to get a handle on all this. It does sound better, doesn't it? It really does. It does sound better. My voice kind of went south, kind of went, well, it kind of went north, south, east, and west during the first service, and so my voice kind of took a toll, and that's why it's up so loud right now, and they're fighting with it. They're, they're trying to please the pastor, and I appreciate their work that they've done up there. I hope the message has encouraged you, and I want to say to you not right now, God is long-suffering, and God will never, ever give up on you. He loves you. And I want to invite you to come down to this altar and say, I want to be introduced to the Father. I want to be introduced to the angels. And if you do, then you need to start confessing Jesus to other people. You need to start taking your stand for Jesus and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. You'll not get on board until you get that hate out of your heart. You'll not get on board until you get that adultery and fornication and lust out of your heart. You've got to truly be born again and truly changed by the Spirit of God. Altars open as they play and sing.